Good afternoon. Welcome to the African American Research Library and Cultural Center. I'm Ramona LaRoche. And on behalf of the center, I'd like to thank you for joining us this afternoon. Today is our series, Cultural Conversations at the Center. The Cultural Conversations mission is to relocate Black culture and history <clears throat> from social margins by making those stories more accessible to those in search of a more inclusive narrative. Through programs like Cultural Conversations, as well as our library and archive, we are committed to bringing you programs and experiences that will broaden minds and impact lives for the better. As the Assistant Head of Adult Services and a proud member of the ARLIC team, it is our sincere pleasure to offer these programs that illuminate, honor, celebrate, and educate with respect to the many contributions of Black people who continue to make the human experience richer through their creative genius. I take, I'd like to take a moment to just pour a libation because we know that all of the work that we do could not be done without us standing on the shoulders of our ancestors. I share, give thanks. And finally, we want to tell you that this event of our series would not be possible without the generous support of the Broward County Libraries, the Friends of the African American Research Library and Cultural Center, and Florida International University's Wolfsonian Public Humanities Lab, the Center for Humanities in an Urban Environment, and the Cuban Research Institute and African and African Diaspora Studies programs at the Stephen J. Green School of International and Public Affairs. As we celebrate Latinx Heritage Month, today's guests will provide us a lively and colorful discussion. Dr. Matthew Petway examines how the portrayal of African ideas of spirit and cosmos and otherwise conventional texts recur throughout early Cuban literature and became the basis for Juan Francisco Manzano and Gabriel de la Concepcion Valdez Placido, anti-slavery philosophy. Dr. Matthew Petway is an assistant professor of Spanish at the University of South Alabama. Petway has published articles in the publication of the Afro-Latin American Association, the Zora Neale Hurston Forum, the American Studies Journal, and Del Caribe in addition to entries in the Dictionary of the Caribbean and Afro-Latin American Biography. He has also contributed to the inaugural essay to the volume of Black Writing Culture in the State in Latin America. I'd like to now bring to join me Dr. Matthew Petway. Hi, Matt. How are you? <laughs> I'm doing well. It's been a while since Charleston. I haven't seen you. <laughs> I know it's good to see you, even though it's not live, but thank you so much for joining us today. Absolutely. It's an honor. It's an honor. So I'd like to just like kind of jump right into it. I've already introduced you. And of course, our um, listeners today, we know that you're discussing your new book, The Cuban Literature in the Age of the Black Insurrection. And I'm going to turn it right over to you so you can begin. Awesome. That's wonderful. Well, I'm excited to be here. Uh, Cuban literature in the age of Black insurrection is the story of two African descended uh, poets, Juan Francisco Manzano and Gabriel de la Concepcion Valdez, who is better known as Placido. Uh, what's really interesting about these poets is that uh, Juan Francisco Manzano might be thought of as a Cuban Frederick Douglass uh, because he was enslaved and he later became free. Auto, he was also autodidactic, uh, like um, Mr. Douglas was, but he published his slave narrative five years prior to Douglas. That's important. And Placio, in some ways, might be thought of as a Martin Delaney figure if we need a heuristic, uh, because Placio uh, was born free. Uh, he was born actually to um, a, a Spanish mother from the north of Spain. Uh, Burgos, one of those sounds thought to have less influence by African and um, Arab Muslims, or otherwise often referred to as the Moors. Uh, and uh, 
father of African descent said to be one fourth African, uh, as if such a thing could really exist, but essentially a man of African descent and a Spanish woman. Uh, so what's really interesting about my book is my book tells a story about how these two men who were essentially inculcated with the norms of Spanish Catholicism uh, and acknowledged Catholicism as the official religion of the Spanish empire and who were themselves baptized, baptized as Catholics and married in the church, who received the last rites when they died, how these men also drew upon Yoruba and Bakongo inspired ideas of spirit and cosmos and that these ideas were for them instrumental, uh, not only in terms of the cult broader cultural identity, a transculturated cultural identity, but it was instrumental in their writing that it influenced some of the poetry and prose that they produced. And uh, I make that argument that it's an argument that has not been made before. Typically they have been seen as being fully assimilated and I argue that it was not the case. But not only that, uh, Manzano and Palazzo didn't work entirely in isolation because in the year 1839, sometime around the year 1839, and that, that year is debated, it was debated by the two of them or disputed by the two of them. They come into contact and they strike up a friendship and uh, they develop an aesthetic collaboration, an important aesthetic collaboration. And um, they both become involved to differing degrees uh, with the 1844 anti-slavery movement, uh, more commonly known as the latter conspiracy or La Escalera, La Escalera. And it's called La Escalera because people of African descent were tied to ladders and they were, they were physically tortured. So their bodies were entirely bare. Uh, we know for a fact that Manzano and Plasso uh, were subjected to tortures. Uh, so my book essentially starts demonstrating the journey, the process by which they become anti-slavery intellectuals using African-inspired spirituality uh, in order to acquire power to free themselves. And then we, the book ends essentially with Manzano and Placido meeting one another. And uh, we essentially talk about the trouble they got into. So that'd be a, a summary. Thank you, Matt. That, that's a great summary. So <clears throat> I realized in uh, reading the book that it's a wealth of information in it. And so when we were discussing what we wanted to focus on today, um, we talked about a few things. But one thing that I noted um, was that Placido and Masano were not the first Cubans of African descent to produce literature. That honor actually belongs to Manuel del Socorro Rodriguez for his writings commemorating the Spanish royalty in 1788, mm -hmm. and to Juana Pastor for Decimus, a sonnet that she composed in 1815. With that in mind, the, particularly the author, the latter author, I wanted to focus today a bit on the role that women may have played in your book. So those are the kind of things that we're kind of look, going to look at today and explore because um, we had to narrow it down. Absolutely. And, um, <laughs> I, and I'm excited. I'm, I'm looking forward to, to uh, what you have to share with us. I know you had some images and some various things that you wanted to share. So yeah. I'm going to turn it back over to you and let you. Okay, well, you feel free. Please feel free. You know, let's uh, keep, it, keep it as fluid as possible. Ask for any types of uh, any questions about clarification. Feel free to interrupt. Uh, okay. What I'm going to do very briefly uh, is I'm going to show the images now and uh, briefly explain them uh, so that I can focus a bit more on, uh, on talking about the significance of women of African descent in my book, Cuban Literature in the Age of Black Insurrection. Women of African descent, both as historical personages as well as uh, literary characters, to turn okay. out to be very significant. And it's the first time anyone's asked me to talk about this, so I just kind of feel like it's it's really in a lot of ways a right. very right uh, thing. so okay. the images uh that i have in mind take us here i'm gonna have to take a moment here and start this presentation properly so i'll just take a moment here uh I, don't see it. I hope that's visible is that visible to you okay ramona yes Yes. Okay, wonderful. So the first image that I have here is actually an image I wanted to put in the book, ultimately did not end up in the book, 
And that's a photograph. This is the best quality I could get of a mural uh, depicting 19th century Cuban literati, essentially. You'll notice here that you have men and women here to what is my left. And uh, they're considered to be the white literati. And you have two men of African descent to the right uh, who that are depicting Manzano and Placio. Now, we don't know how either of those men looked. Uh, we know that the image of Placio was significantly whitened by his white biographers. And so that image of him on the mural in Old Havana that I took back in 2012, when I still lived in the Northeast, is actually not an accurate depiction of Placio. But he was a man of African and European descent. Manzano was a man of African descent. And uh, we're going to talk about the significance of his mother in one second. Uh, so also in order to introduce this topic of women of African descent as uh, historically significant in my book, as well as being significant uh, from a symbolic standpoint, I want to share this image of the Black Venus, this sculpture here. Um, what's interesting with regard to Placido is that Placido, though he was a person of named and claimed African ancestry, as um, George Reed Andrews would put it, he was an Afro-Latin American. Uh, Palacio was someone who did not make an attempt to pass uh, for white or, to, or he didn't claim whiteness. And this actually became a political problem for him. And when he is questioned, uh, along with Monsanto as being part of that anti-slavery movement, one of the things that is brought up is the fact that he was proud to be a person of African descent and didn't want to claim membership uh, in the white race. And uh, so that went entirely against the color scheme that the Spanish government and uh, Spanish colonial society in Cuba had established in order to divide Af people of African descent along color lines, essentially this question of colorism or pigmentocracy. Placido um, actually fell in love with um, a woman named Rafaela, uh, known by Fela. He wrote several poems to her. And she was a woman that was uh, considered to be not only of African descent, darker than mahogany, she was a woman who was said to be jet black. And she was often called a uh, Venus for her beauty. Uh, I have another image here I want to share just as a way of setting up what I'm going to talk about with regard to Manzano's mother, Plasso's mother, and some of the other significant women. And uh, this is a painting uh, by a, a European painter named Brunias, B-R-U-N-I-A-S. And this image in particular kind of will give us an idea about how women of African descent dressed and their significance in society as well. It gives you an idea about the people of different cues. Um, in a society like the Cuban society, if someone had a European ancestor, they could claim to be something other than black. And that's really the reason why I'm using the term people of African descent rather than simply calling them black as I would as an African-American born in Detroit, right? So the inverse, essentially, of the one drop rule was true in the Hispanophone Caribbean and throughout uh, Spanish America and Portuguese America. And what that meant is that um, the society was structured in a way to encourage people to claim as much European ancestry as possible. And the more European ancestry someone was able to prove, the more uh, social privileges they would be able to claim. That did not necessarily mean they would be able to exercise professions uh, like become a college professor, for example, or be members of the priesthood. Uh, they were typically uh, barred from doing that. People of African descent were typically barred from being members of the priesthood in colonial Spanish America. They were barred from carrying firearms. They were barred from attending the university. Uh, and they were barred from, certainly from being college professors. Uh, so if one wanted those privileges, one could, if they had the wealth, purchase whiteness. And there are some specific cases of individuals actually paying money to become white in Spanish American society. And I say all of that because it would be difficult for us to understand the political work of the women uh, in my book if we don't understand the ways in which they're fighting not only gender uh, restrictions, uh, fighting against the myth and the system of male supremacy, but also the ways in which they're dealing with color politics. Um, the next image that I'm sharing here is a famous painting by uh, Jacob Peter Gowie. 
of Icarus with his father Daedalus. And Icarus is falling essentially from the sky. Uh, Icarus and Daedalus, of course, escaped from the labyrinth um, that, um, that Minos built in the island of Crete. And essentially they're escaping from some form of captivity. So I wanna share that image. I will be discussing this a little bit later when we talk about Manzano's poem, A Dream for My Second Brother, which is inspired in part by his mother's uh, charge for him to free himself and to become a father to his siblings upon his, his own father's demise, after his own father had passed away. And finally, this image here uh, is one of an indigenous man being burned at the stake by uh, Spanish soldiers as well as a priest. The priest is evidently trying to convert him prior to his death. And uh, what is significant about this is that one of the poems that is related to the 1844 anti-slavery movement was produced by Placido, by Placido. And uh, that poem honors an indigenous Taino ancestor who, who came, who was originally from what is today Haiti, who refused conversion and uh, said he would rather be burned at the stake than be in heaven, reportedly burn the stake than be in heaven than um, uh, than be in heaven with the Spaniards. So he became an important symbol of resistance. So now that I've shared those images, um, I'd like to take the opportunity to talk a little bit more about the women in the book. And you know, once again, Ramona, feel free to break in any time. Uh, one of the interesting differences about Manzano and Placido is that Manzano was someone who was born on a plantation in 1797. That's the best day we have for his birth and who dies in 1853. Plas was born in 1809 after Manzano uh, and he is executed in 1844 by the Spanish uh, colonial government. Uh, Manzano escapes execution in the 1844 movement and I deal with that uh, extensively in chapter six of my book. But Monsanto was born on the plantation, um, and, uh, or I should say he's born into slavery in Havana. And he is the son of Maria del Pilar and Toribio de Castro. And those two um, African descended individuals were enslaved domestic servants. His mother, Maria del Pilar is significant, um, not only because she was his mother, but because she was a woman who in fact ran the household. Uh, she was the most significant uh, uh, enslaved person in the household. So they were enslaved domestics. Uh, and for that reason, many critics have tended to assume that Manzano was fully assimilated to Spanish Catholicism because of the fact that he was in the big house, so to speak, La Casa Grande, y que no estaba en la plantación misma, that he wasn't actually on the plantation. Uh, but my research demonstrates that that is actually uh, not entirely true. So she's significant for that reason. Plasso's experience is different because he's orphaned by his Spanish mother um, and as a child, and he's actually raised initially, well, he's initially um, taken to an orphanage, a Catholic orphanage, in case he's baptized. He's described as al parecer blanco, white appearance. Once again, the significance of pigmentocracy, right? He would have had, though poor, rather poor, he would have had the option of claiming uh, proximity to whiteness, but he chose not to. And that was an important political choice that Gabriel de la Concepcion Valdez made, something for us to keep in mind as we struggle today against multiple systems of white supremacy, and particularly taking what occurred earlier this week into account. Um, so with regard to both poets, uh, Maria, Maria de Pilar, uh, Manzano's uh, mother, was essentially a matriarchal figure. I'm not comfortable Called to call her matriarch is true to an extent, but she essentially didn't have full power over her children and neither did her father, neither did her, neither did her husband, excuse me, Toribio de Castro. There's a scene in the book, in fact, in which the, the, uh, the mistress, the enslaver, Monsanto's first enslaver, who he called Mamma Mia when he was a boy, he was particularly close to that, the first mistress, um, which in which she corrects Monsanto's father and tells him, you don't have the right to beat your son, or you don't have the right to punish or discipline your son. That's the principle at stake, uh, essentially. And um, so, we, so we also know that Manzano was taken away from his parents for long extended periods of time. But 
Maria de Pilar is significant because she inculcates in Manzano certain norms, certain cultural norms. And there's there are a couple of proverbs that made it to the emancipation narrative or Manzano slave narrative, right? Published in 1840 before Douglas. Uh, and Manzano draws upon them, you know? And I, I just, I find it so interesting that he was able to remember some of those proverbs and provide some of those proverbs to us long after his mother had passed. But one of the other significant things that his mother does is that she, uh, she comes to him with what was essentially his family's inheritance. And she says, here's the money to buy your freedom. Your father has died. Now you will become a father to your siblings. And Mathano was unable to do that ultimately because his, his enslaver, uh, the daughter of the Martianess, uh, who's the, uh, the second enslaver, Prado de Ameno, uh, because essentially she takes the inheritance from him. Uh, and then Manzano finds himself in a situation where he has to escape the plantation to save his life and ultimately begin a process by which once he becomes free, he becomes free in Havana in 1836. Uh, once he becomes free, then he begins a process to help his younger brother, uh, Florencio. And he dedicates a poem to him called A Dream uh, for My Second Brother. So I'm going to give you just a little bit more background here. Uh, talk about uh, Concepcion Valdez. Uh, I'm sorry, Concepcion Vasquez. Uh, Plasto's mother, Concepcion Vasquez, and then, uh, you know, feel free to ask uh, some more questions. We can we can keep mixing it up, Ramona. But um, what's significant about Concepcion Vasquez is that she appears to have been absent from Plasto's life by choice, to an extent. We don't know to what to what what extent, but we know that Plasto was raised not with her, but by his black grandmother. According to one source, that person was form a formerly enslaved person uh, in Havana, the extramural neighborhoods of Havana. Um, and so he's really immersed, like Manzano, in not only um, Spanish Catholic culture, but he's immersed in African descended culture. But Plasto did remember her, and he does write a poem to her uh, called Farewell to My Mother, Adios a mi madre, when he knows that he will indeed be executed in the uh, 1844 anti-slavery movement. So that's a, just a little introduction there into the, the women in the book. Um, while we're talking about um, Monsanto's mother, I was wondering, could you speak a little bit more about the relationship between the parents and the, um, the, the, the woman enslaver, just in terms of the dynamics that took place and particularly her relationship, the owner, the slave owner's relationship and how she um, responded or addressed her behavior towards Monsanto. Well, uh, that's, that's a doozy. That's a really painful part of the text. It was difficult to write chapter two in the book uh, because the, the violence against Monsanto is so incredibly extensive. I'm glad you brought that up. Um, his mother, Manzano's mother, Maria de Pilar, uh, and, and his father as well, to give honor to his father, Toribi de Castro, essentially did what they could to ensure him, I don't want to call it privileges, but to ensure essentially that he would not be abused uh, in, in the way that uh, enslaved people would be working in the field. Uh, presumably more abused, and that he wouldn't be he wouldn't be taken away for good. But he, he he was taken away sometimes for years at a time, and I deal with that in the book. So that's sort of thing they would be called kidnapping. Um, the other thing that takes place is that once his first mistress dies and Monsanto's father has died, uh, the the daughter of the marsh the first Martianess, um, Prado de Ameno, essentially takes it upon herself to teach Monsanto. Uh, what it really means to be an enslaved person. And she, she, he says he became her little mulatto. And that's a very denigrating process. I mean, um, not only does she abuse him, but she's threatened by a couple of things. There's at least two things she's threatened by. And one of the things she's threatened by is the fact that she can see that he has a prodigious memory. He will remember mm -hmm. sermons. Right. <laughs> The Catholic priest. So he's remembering the proverbs from the African descended part of his family. And at the same time, you know, here he is 
you know, uh, also remembering sermons. Um, and so she's threatened by that. He's improvising verse. There's a young black girl he calls Serafina, or Serafina. And he's like, Serafina was my muse. And I would, you know, you know, have this amorous correspondence with her. He probably didn't know a lot about love, but whatever he knew, he was, you know, rapping to her, so to speak. Uh, and so the Martians went to great extents. Uh, that second enslaver, that second mistress, even to the point of uh, setting up a situation in which he was going to be telling the sorcery tales that he told or improvising decimas, because uh, he would tell sorcery tales to the children, presumably he hid her from, from the elders. Uh, and there may have been a fictive element to it as well. We don't know a lot about those sorcery tales, but we do know he's talking about the power dynamic, the power concept. Mm -hmm. Essentially, this notion that ritual power can bring about change in the natural world, according to an African cosmology. And, uh, and she sets him up, and then uh, she punishes him terribly. She punishes him terribly. And she, uh, she what exactly happens to my son, I think it's better to read the book in order to get, a, get a, an understanding with regard to that. Uh, but he does survive the incident. And as soon as he survives the incident and physically he's bleeding, he goes right to his mother. He goes right to his mother. And then you have the instance where he defends his, his, uh, his mother as well from abuse. So he, she's abused because she's protecting him, which once again, she's not supposed to be doing. Right. Okay, because she, she doesn't, this is, makes me think of uh, Hortense Spiller's article, Mama's Baby, Papa's Maybe. Essentially, though the Spanish slave code wouldn't have described Manzano as chattel per se, but rather a part of the family system. I'm thinking about the medieval Spanish slave code. In effect, he was. He was property. In fact, he was chattel. Um, but there were a couple of things that Spanish slave society did differently. And one of those things is that it provided uh, at least on paper, the right for enslaved people to own property and the right to marry. And that was significant because it turns out that Monsanto's family actually had um, horses, they had a mare. Mm -hmm. And uh, the family named, his grandfather named those horses for, you know, or dedicate those horses to different children. We don't know what the names were or anything like that, but we know to dedicate them. Monsanto says all this in the same narrative. And I bring that to four in the book. I analyze essentially the way in which she's trying to, when she refuses to allow him to take his inheritance and buy his freedom, another thing that she's doing is that she's essentially saying to him that um, I am the owner of all that you possess. And so she's negating law. I am the owner of all that you possess. Don't bring this up again. She says, if you bring it up again, I'll put you where the sun doesn't shine. Um, and so that's that, that, that uh, is what I would really share, Ramona, as a way of kind of explaining essentially the power. Um, the poem, A Dream for My Second Brother, is a poem that Monsanto produces once he's already been freed. And he's looking to fulfill his mother's trust by presumably by freeing his brother. So a question is coming, uh, when could women first own property? Do we have a, a date on that? or don't idea? have a date with regard uh, to that. Uh, I know that enslaved people had the right, the legal right to own property uh, in Spanish slave society, and they had the right to marry. Uh, I don't know the gender dynamics of that. I now, don't wanna, often, I don't get into that. oftentimes, British slavery has been compared to Spanish slavery. Mm -hmm. And people sometimes say that the um, the slavery from Spain was better because people had this right to go to court. And like you said, they could have property and stuff. But I, I, I don't think that's correct information. I, I think I, I mean, Monsano's story can attest to just how much he was abused. Um, and even though they were what we would call in the United States house servants, you know, as opposed to field hands, um, they still had to deal with a lot, a whole lot, and particularly him. Um, this whole idea of the mistress controlling his mouth, mm -hmm. his ability to speak, That's right. um, because his words were power. I mean, That's and, right. and from a young age, we're not talking about like 10, we're talking about when he was younger. He was He's very you know, young. Yeah, he was doing these sermons and, and, and so forth. So they compare him to Rousseau. They compare him to Rousseau and Voltaire. 
<laughs> yeah. So he was a threat early on to the powers that be, particularly also because the masters and mistresses were the were empowered by the church, the Catholic Church. So that was the real threat. Um, you know, from my understanding, the real right. threat was that you had these voices that might give some competition to the rule of the church, if you will. That's the question of sacred authority that I deal with in the book. In fact, if I go back briefly to the episode in Monsanto's Emancipation Narrative, where uh, his first mistress, his first enslaver, uh, the Marchioness of Justicia Santa Ana, when she corrects his father, she goes to the priest. She doesn't go to the overseer. She goes to the priest. She appeals to the priest, and the priest corrects Monsanto's father. Uh, for her. Uh, so it doesn't seem as if she was interested in having Monsanto's father, Toribe de Castro, who was a harpist, who was himself, you know, an enslaved domestic servant. Uh, I don't think she wanted him bludgeoned, beaten, um, uh, berated. She wanted to check him. She wanted to put him in his place. And she's using the sacred authority of the Spanish Catholic Church, which argued that slavery would help uh, Africans to uh, to cease to be slaves of the devil, esclavo de diablo, para convertirse en hijo de Dios, to go from being slaves of the devil to the sons of God. And so when we think of the Catholic Church today, we think of a rather progressive pope, but we should remember, and this is why we don't need myth, right? When it comes to African-American history, uh, African Afro-Latin American history or US history, we need historical truth, right? We should remember that ever since the 1400s, right? Since 1455, we have papal bulls. Uh, we have authoritative letters from the papacy granting before Spain, Portugal, the authority to enslave Af Africans that would not submit to uh, the divine law of the church. So the church is claiming in the in medieval period, in the 1400s, claiming worldwide control, something that would seem absurd because the church didn't have an army. Uh, but it wouldn't need an army because it turned out that Spain and Portugal were more than willing to carry out uh, its dictates. Uh, mm -hmm. So colonial Catholicism as well as colonial Protestantism really have to be looked at very critically to understand even the way the redemption narrative function. Mm -hmm. um, so, so to your point, yes, yes, uh, she she appealed to the, the authority of the church in order to uh, to validate what it was that she wanted to do. One of the things also that's interesting to me is that we're talking about the power of the church as related back to like, I guess the 1400s or so, but also in comparison, you have the Congolese power that's going on and how uh, the political force between mid 15th to 17th century in the Congo was so strong. Mm -hmm. So you have this like major pull, if you will, between the Congolese and the, the Catholicism going on. Mm -hmm. And it's really interesting to see how the um, the, the Catholics, the, the Christianity kind of embedded into Africa and then, you know, try to bring on that term of colonial control, or, you know, again, mm -hmm. around spirituality. So the, so the heathens had to be Christ, Christianized in order to, oh, you know, right with God, if you oh, will. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so. You can make up anything if you have paper and pen. Yeah. <laughs> Anything that's in your economic interest. It was certainly in the economic interest of the Portuguese crown and the Spanish crown to do this. Uh, did you want me to comment briefly on the Congo or would you like to go back? Um, to I'd, like, the um, I'd like to go back a little bit while we're still on Monsanto and you talked about Icarus and the, the image that you showed. So um, in the Greek mythology, Icarus is the son of Dedulus, is, it? is that how you say right. the craftsman who yeah. created the labyrinth? And so I, my question, well, was this um, labyrinth, labyrinth, excuse me, um, was that the, the escapee to freedom? Because when you think of a labyrinth, it's like this maze and you have all these directions you can go. Yeah. And the fact that he would choose Icarus as a symbol, and then his, this, this person who made this, his father, you know, made these mazes and stuff. I just thought it was an interesting, you know, so my I like question, how you, I like how you open that up. I like how you open that up with that question, because um, it struck me when I, in fact, to share a little story briefly, uh, it was this poem. The poem is called for the audience, "Un Sueño a Mi Segundo Hermano," uh, 
a dream for my second brother. And my son published this in 1838 in, uh, in Havana um, in a book called El Album. And what is so very interesting about the poem is that uh, it was the poem that really convinced me that Manzano should be read through a more complicated lens, not as someone who's fully assimilated to Spanish Catholicism. So in the poem, essentially what Manzano does is he tells his brother of a dream that he had about his brother. And at the beginning of the poem, what he's doing is he's escaping He's escaping uh, the slave plantation, but he doesn't say I escaped the plantation. He said, uh, huy de los hombres, huyendo de los hombres, escaping men. Uh, he escapes to the hills in this poem and uh, in order to find peace and to lament in secret. Lamentarme en secreto, así lo dice en español, lamentarme en secreto. And then what he does is he falls asleep and without knowing how, two wings sprout from his back and he begins to take flight and he flies around, uh-huh, dando vueltas, kind of in circles. And he's able to see the plantation where his younger brother Florencio is still enslaved. And he's also able to see uh, the runaway community known in Cuban Spanish as El Palenque, the Maroon community. He sees both of those communities and then he goes to the plantation, he goes back to that, that locus horrendous, right? Leaving the, uh, the hills where he has become a winged being, a bird. He finds his brother and uh, as he's coming down, he doesn't simply just go and grab his brother, pick his brother up and leave. Instead, he flies around in circles and he moves around with feathers in his hands, he says, with his chest toward Matanzas. Matanzas was the province in Cuba that uh, had incredibly large numbers of enslaved people. I believe the largest numbers of enslaved people were in Matanzas, if I remember correctly. And, but his parents were buried there in the sugar labor camp, the slave labor camp or plantation. And so he does this, what is, what is apparently a ritual, a Bacongo inspired ritual with his chest toward the graveyard, the slave cemetery. And then he lands in the center of the earth. At some point, he goes, takes the flight again, finds his brother on the plantation as a ro robust Ethiopian, as he describes him, Ethiopian meaning in this case, a black man, a man of African descent, not initially from the country of Ethiopia. This is a 19th century commonplace. And he kisses him, takes him into his arm, and, and he says, let's leave our enemy soil. So Cuba is enemigo suelo. In este poema, Cuba es enemigo suelo. So fascinante, fascinante. Uh, a Dream for My Second Brother is a poem that should be taught, quite frankly, in every college, in English translation or in the Spanish original. Uh, but the Icarus moment becomes significant for us as readers uh, because you have this neoclassical accent in what is otherwise a poem born of Spanish romanticism where Manzano essentially becomes Icarus. And though he has his brother in his arms, he suffers what is essentially a third moment of descent in the text. And he awakes from his dream. His brother is gone. His brother is gone. And, uh, and like Icarus, you know, he falls to the ground essentially. So that's the significance of, uh, of Icarus in that poem. But, but, but with regard, I want to explain the poem first, and I hope it wasn't too long-winded. I want to explain the poem first, but I think of the labyrinth, um, King uh, Minos' labyrinth, as slave society, not as slavery itself. Because when you think about Daedalus and Icarus, Daedalus being the father in this Greek myth, Icarus being the son, right, the one who flies too close to the sun, and whose wings melt, and who comes crashing down, right? What's so interesting about this is essentially they're already being held in captivity, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so it's, it's a really, it's very, it's brilliant. Really brilliant, I think, what Monsanto did with that. Um, so Minos is, uh, he's acting like a god, right? He's a, he's a legendary king of Crete. He's acting like a god. Um, Monsanto ultimately, when he cannot save his brothers, says the right hand of God changed the weather. There was thunder and lightning. And he loses, he wakes up like Icarus. He falls to the ground and his brother is no longer in his arms. So Matt, can you take a moment and read that particular poem for us? 
I can read a, I can read a piece of the poem. It's uh, okay. okay. I can't tell you how many stanzas it is. Okay. Um, Just some. I will read. Thank you. I'll read select stanzas. Can you hear me well, uh, Ramona? Are you able to hear me well? Ramona? Yes. <laughs> Is my sound quality good? Can, you, can they hear me well? He can't see me. Yes, they can hear you well. Yeah, I'm, I just want to make, make sure. I want to make sure because this, I'm read, I'll be reading from the, from the poem. So I'm going to start with some of the first stanzas, uh, reading from Cuban literature and the age of Black insurrection, Monsanto's 1838 poem something he published two years after he himself uh, was emancipated. Uh, I'll read first in Spanish and then in English. Un sueño a mi segundo hermano. Tú, Florencio, que sabes las penas que padezco, cuán justas y fundadas martirice mi pecho. Sí, tú, que en otros días calmabas mis tormentos, o juntas con las mías tus lágrimas corrieron, Confuso y agobiado, de mil pesares lleno, la soledad buscaba de los hombres huyendo. Hacía el vecino monte que de Quintana, el cerro, domina y ameniza los lugares internos. Apróxeme a un bosque, albergue donde suelo, conmigo querellando, lamentarme en secreto. No sé si de alcanzancio o del mismo desvelo, cerráronse mis ojos a un dulce y grato sueño. So I'm going to jump uh, here uh, to the piece where my son is already in the air, and then I'll read this in English. Visto tanto en el aire, buscaba con angelo el centro de la tierra para posar mi vuelo. Recojo los plumajes, inclino un poco el pecho, y en círculos rodando torno a bajar de nuevo, descendiendo continuo de matanzas al seno, te doy la vista fijo a aquel lugar tremendo, donde yertos reposan los miserables restos de aquellos nuestros padres que el primer ser nos dieron. So I'm going to read those uh, stanzas in English, and then I'll read the final stanza with regard to Icarus. This is indeed one of my favorite poems in the history of uh, 19th century Spanish American literature. Confused, excuse me, I'll go back to the beginning here. What he starts a reference to his, his, uh, his, his brother, using an apostrophe in reference to his brother. Sorencio, you do know the sorrows that I grieve, how justified and understandable they torture my heart. Yes, you, who in bygone days would calm my suffering, for together with mine your tears also ran. Confused and aggrieved, burdened by a thousand woes, I searched for solitude, fleeing from man. Toward the nearby wilderness, where Quintana's hill adorns and dominates the inner spaces. I came to a forest, a refuge I frequent, to quarrel with myself and secretly lament. Whether from fatigue or lack of sleep, I close my eyes for a sweet and pleasant dream. Having seen so much from the air, I eagerly looked for the center of the earth to land for my flight. I gather my feathers, I slightly tilt my chest, and turning in circles, I come down again in a well-aimed descent into the heart of Matanzas. From where I gaze on that terrible place, there lie resting the miserable remains of our parents who gave us our first being. Now the last stanza of significance to us um, is re with regard to Icarus. And uh, Manstano says essentially, um, de salvar no mi vida, sino la que veo próximo a padecer, cual Ícaro el despeño. Entonces, oh Dios mío, retronando y rugiendo de tu terrible diestra con ímpetu violento, me sorprende y despierto, buscando entre mis brazos lo que llevó mi sueño. To save not my life, 
but rather the one that is nearly lost, like Icarus, the precipitous descent. Then, oh my God, booming and roaring, your terrible right hand with violent force, I am surprised and I awaken, searching in my arms for the one that my dream took away. So that is Ramona essentially much of the poem, uh, A Dream for My Second Brother. And what's significant, that poem is, is connected to our interest in women in uh, Cuban literature and the age of black insurrection because Manzano in effect goes in search for his brother in the way that he does because his mother has given him that charge. And at this point, his mother is an ancestor. So in the West Central African or Bacongo inspired traditions in Cuba, typically known as Palomonte, Palomonte is a of African tradition, um, practitioners do work with the dead. They, uh, they uh, invoke the power of the dead to change realities in the material world. So what I argue in the book is that when Manzano is very much aware of the doctrines of Spanish Catholicism, that he's rejecting the redemptive narrative, uh, the notion that he must be saved, so to speak. Uh, he's instead looking to procure the power necessary to himself. That's, uh, that's uh, evidence of that, essentially. But once again, that's tied to his mother, who had the inheritance. That's tied to his mother, who for some reason outlived his father. Well, he spoke of his father with great respect, that he was a man of honor. Uh, so, although he may have had some to work with his father that was unresolved. That, that's someone else's project. Someone who a whole thing on Manzano and gender, uh, particularly masculinity. Thank but, you, man. Uh, yeah. One of our viewers said that that was deeply touched and felt. So I just want to share that with you. Uh, can, can, I share talk? Can, I, can I share something really quickly? Then, of course. One of the reasons why that poem speaks so much to me as an author, though I'm a, a Spanish professor and you know, uh, and an African American, not, not a Cuban, it speaks to me in part because I also lost a brother myself, uh, Timothy, my younger brother, and my book is actually dedicated to him. So the first article I published in Spanish, I published in El Caribe, in Santiago de Cuba, not Havana, but Santiago de Cuba, in a journal in Casa de Caribe where they honor the work, the Congo inspired work. Some of those first West Central Africans were brought against the real in the Christian country, that particular part of the, of the country. And I dedicated the book to Timothy, and that's one of the reasons why I wrote that poem so much myself. So I want to honor Thank him you. too. Thank you for sharing that. Um, it's mm -hmm. definitely, you know, when we think about the whole um, memorialization of honoring our ancestors and our, you know, people that have passed on. I mean, it's so universal. I mean, you know, whether you're talking about, I don't know, the Mexican Day of the Dead, or whether you're mm -hmm. talking about Gullah people who, you know, have um, wakes and, and yeah. ceremonies and so and But Congo people as well. So mm -hmm. that's in South Carolina that I'm talking about. Um, but I did want to take a moment and now talk a little bit about Placido and the, the women connected to him, if you will. And I, I guess that would be, you already talked about his first love, but um, you talked a little bit about his mother. But I guess I'm thinking more about um, his mother-in-law. Mm -hmm. I remember we talked a bit about that and her influence or you know connection to this liberation struggle, if you will. So what's interesting is that uh, today when we think of marriage, we typically think of it from the standpoint of, you know, who yes. you're so with. if you could um, tell us a bit more about his mother-in-law and sure. her relationship to the struggle and, you know, their sure. connection. Sure. Uh, and you, the sound quality is still good. You can still hear me well. Okay. You can still hear me well. Ramona, can you hear me well? Are we good? Can you hear me? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Just one moment. Okay. I can hear you. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Can you hear me? We're still, we're, we're working, we're having a okay. little technical moment, but it's coming. Okay. Okay. I think you should be good now. Let's try it. Okay. Can you hear me? 
Ramona, can you hear me? Can you hear me? No. You can't okay, hear me? Okay, just one second, Matt. Okay. We're having a, a little break with your sound, so just bear with us. So while, while we're waiting for this, since you can hear me, let me once again encourage and invite everyone to visit our Broward County Library website. There you can find all our wonderful and upcoming programs. We have a lot of virtual events um, in so many arenas for both adults as well as children and youth. So we invite you to, okay, we invite you to check okay, how, how's that sound now? So I think we're back, Matt. Can you hear me well? Ramona, can you hear me? Okay. Can you hear me? No. Okay. I can hear you. Again, so what, you know, I once again want to thank our sponsors because without our sponsors, this would not be happening. Once again, we, we, we thank the friends of the African American Research Library and Cultural Center. And the friends are always looking for new members and people to support us. So if you're interested, please contact us. And also, I want to definitely send out a thanks to Florida International University, uh, the Wilsonian Public Humanities Lab, the Center for Humanities and Urban Environment, and the Cuban Research Institute, as well as the African and African Diaspora um, Studies Departments. Um, they came through. They were very supportive in a number Remember, of the ways. The audience, can, the audience can hear me. And we thank them. The audience, the audience can hear me. Yes. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. So with regard to, I was going to say that when we think of marriage today, we typically think of questions of who are, you know, who are you in love with? Who do you want to spend the rest of your life with? Uh, we forget that marriage is in many ways political, that the choice of, you know, who you marry uh, can also really speak to what you believe and to your worldview. And in the case of Placido, particularly in a society that was a pigmentocracy, uh, where there was a very important color uh, pyramid, uh, Placido was supposed to be positioned towards the top of that pyramid. So he made the decision twice to associate so deeply with the community of African descent that he married a black free woman, not Fela, who died in a cholera epidemic, something we can really relate to today in the times of uh, the coronavirus. But, uh, but another woman by the name of Maria Gila Morales Poveda, and it was her mother, his, Plasso's mother-in-law, her mother, Pilar Poveda, uh, that played a significant role in the 1844 movement. So uh, Plasso essentially married into a political family. So why was she significant? Well, she was part of that free African descended population that matched with the African population had then become larger than the white population on the island. Uh, Pilar Poveda was a midwife. And between 1820 and 1845, she was one of the most significant, uh, most uh, successful midwives uh, in, in Western Cuba, according to uh, Deschamps Chapeau, Cuban historian Deschamps Chapeau. Um, now, what would a midwife have to do with the 1844 movement? Well, the women had command of the domestic sphere. They had command of the house. And uh, what Pilar Poveda did is that she actually provided space for the men who were organized in this anti-slavery movement to, to meet. She provided space. And she provided a safe space for them to conspire. And uh, so she appears, uh, my research, particularly my research at Harvard University, she appears several different letters uh, about the anti-slavery movement. And at one point, um, there's one, at least one of my sources complained that she was more powerful than her husband. So, uh, whose name was uh, Dorotea Morales. So that's really the way in which Pla the women in Plasso's life were tied to the 1844 movement. But uh, Pilar Poveda, Plasso's mother-in-law was not, uh, thankfully was not executed. Though it appears like Plasso and Manzano, she may have been tortured. Uh, what the historical record says essentially not is that she was tortured, but that she's resting in the hospital. So these are the kinds of euphemisms 
that the Spanish colonial record preferred. Thank you. What about some of the other images that we have in the book? Um, the Virgin of the Rosary, Dada, the royal sister of Shango, um, Cuba personified as an Afro-Caribbean woman. Can you speak to some of those images? Sure, sure. I would love to take a question or two from the audience before, while we still have a chance as well. Some time where we, we, we decided that we would go and the last, in about five more minutes, we're gonna be opening up to the audience. Oh, great. Okay, wonderful. Uh, well, let me speak about, uh, I'll say this. I want the audience to know more or less who we're referring to when we talk about uh, Dada, we're talking about the sister, uh, we're talking about African divine spirits. So one of the things my book explores are, is the uh, two African cosmologies, two conceptions of the spirit world uh, that doesn't appear so much as a doctrine, but it's something that people are taught in the informal way. So general understandings about the universe and the place of humankind within the universe. That would be a formal definition of cosmology. Um, what African cosmologies uh, tend to purport is that there's a creator, creator in the uh, Yoruba tradition. Those, the names of that creator would be Olodumare, Olorun, Olofi. And uh, within the West Central African tradition coming out of Angola, particularly uh, Northern Angola, uh, well, I might call it a Congo inspired or Congolese inspired tradition. Uh, and Sambi would be the name of that creator, of the creator. But the relationship between the creator and mankind or humankind is mediated by spirits of the deceased, as in the case of my son was former dream for my second brother. And is also mediated by uh, the sovereigns of the uh, forces of nature, uh, the spirits that control the force of nature known as Orisha. So if you think about Beyonce's Black is King, and uh, you think about some of her representations prior to that, and then we see the Lemonade album, and she comes out and she's wearing yellow, and there's water flowing out of this building, which appears to be a library. Um, sure, she's you know essentially getting revenge on her husband, I guess in a symbolic kind of a sense, but what she's also doing is she's channeling a particular African divine spirit, and that divine spirit is Oshun, or Ochun, and if I don't Ochun, and what Africans did, whether they were from what is today Nigeria or what is today Angola, is they essentially connected their, uh, their notions of the divine. They connected the African divine spirits to the Catholic saints. The Catholic saints became initially, and I'm thinking the late 18th century, they initially became a cover for African divine spirits. But what um, Africans were looking for were either conceptual parallels or they were paying attention to the colors of those particular entities. So there was a political need for Africans who had religious confraternities to disguise the true religious identity. I'm not gonna call them deities, I'm gonna call them Orishas or African divine spirits to, to, to essentially hide that, to conceal that. Um, but also there was this reality that in the spiritual worldview or in the cosmology of the Africans, whether they were Yoruba speaking Africans or Kikongo speaking Africans from what is today Angola, um, they also saw conceptual parallels. And so for someone who was becoming familiar with the Cuban environment, it would be very easy to say, ha, Oshun always shows up where there's water because she's the sovereign of the sweet waters. Look at this apparition of, uh, of the Virgin Mary. This is an apparition over the water. And so that apparition would be associated with either Yamaya or with Oshun. In the book, I look at uh, religious confraternities, these religious organizations that uh, Africans established and African descendants established uh, with differing levels of connection and proximity to the Catholic, Spanish Catholic Church. The Cabildos were the ones, the uh, religious confraternities that Africans themselves established, not only in Cuba, but throughout Latin America. So Brazil as well, one of the most fascinating things about traveling to Latin America is, you know, finding out more about these religious confraternities. So essentially, Plasso publishes this poem, though he is an African descendant of a lighter hue. Uh, he publishes this poem in conjunction uh, with these African cabildos. He published three such poems. And one of those poems he dedicates to 
a particular manifestation of the Virgin Mary, who is understand, understood to be in Catholicism, potentially present, right? She can appear in one place, she can appear in another place according to Catholicism. And he dedicates it to the Virgin of the Rosary. Well, the Virgin of the Rosary was essentially this, uh, this manifestation of the Virgin Mary where the, uh, the church had insisted that Africans that didn't know much about uh, Catholicism could come to and become familiar with Catholicism through the Virgin Mary. And they were supposed to use a rosary in the process of praying. So Placido takes essentially that particular representation and he turns it on his head because he places the version of the rosary within the African religious brotherhood, not the religious brotherhood of people who identified as mulattoes, as lighter skinned um, African descendants understood to be of a different racial category, an entirely different racial category. But instead he places that version of the rosary who has been transculturated with Dada, uh, an African divine spirit called Dada, within an African cabildo. And that becomes further significant when you realize that that particular spirit is the sister of a warrior called Shango. The other significance with regard to Dada, um, and that the image of the version of the rosary in my book, the other significance is that uh, it was these confraternities that turned out to be involved in the 1844 movement. I don't study that in detail in my book, but you can find other Cuba scholars that do explore that. So that's what I can share about Dada. I share a lot of details, but it's a little complex. Um, the other thing Ramona would be, of course, um, Cuba personified as a woman. My students just dealt with that in uh, LG336 here at the University of South Alabama. So um, would you like me to talk about that or do you want to take a question? I'm ready to take a question. Um, a question. We have a question you know. from a, a friend of the library, Dr. Proenza Coles. Um, she says, having visited the shrine of the Virgin of Cobre and other religious sites in Cuba, she wonders if there is a nationalization of African religious precepts. In other words, whereas in the 19th century, these spiritual ideas were politically dangerous, how do they operate today? And they become more widely assimilated. Okay. Well, that um, it depends. I would I would say this first and foremost: uh, the Virgin uh, of Cobre, La Virgen de Cobre, uh, also known as the Virgin of Charity, is essentially the patroness of Cuba. And the uh, according to oral tradition, uh, you had two indigenous men and an African man who had an encounter over water in Eastern Cuba, not Western Cuba, where Manzano and Plasto were later born, but had an encounter with the Virgin of the Rosary uh, over a body of water. And uh, that particular encounter with the, not Virgin of the Rosary, excuse me, the Virgin of Charity or the Virgin of Copper, La Virgen de Cobre, they had an encounter with her there over the water. Uh, she is understood to be, because she appeared to them, and they were in this particular pigmentocracy on the bottom of that society, particularly the African man who, who uh, I believe he's known as Juan Moreno, it's understood to be uh, the patroness of the vulnerable, right? Well, that particular path uh, to the Virgin Mary, the Virgin of Copper, the Virgin of Charity has been transculturated with Oshun. Now, when that transculturation takes place is not something I explore in my book, but you could look at the work of uh, Mimi Sanford the entire book on Oshun that Mimi Sanford um, edited with Joseph Murphy. Uh, there's a chapter on that. Today, the attitudes that Cubans have with regard to the Virgin of Copper or La Virgen de Caridad de Cobre, I think depend in part on their tradition. There are some people who I understand still see her as the Virgin Mary, uh, but many understand her to be transculturated with that African divine spirit, to be Oshun. She has the same colors as, uh, as Oshu. Uh, and she's definitely a symbol of national identity. African inspired religion is, um, as well as spiritualism, uh, which doesn't have, a, or spiritism, which doesn't have an African origin, but does walk hand in hand with the African inspired traditions. So spiritism can be found in some uh, white Cubans, right? Some white Cubans who practice 
um, really quite frankly, uh, has the entire island is suffused with African religious precepts. Uh, even the Cuban Revolution uh, was triumphed in 1959 when uh, Fidel Castro, Raul Castro, Che Guevara came to power, defeating uh, Batista, uh, could not silence entirely um, African-inspired ideas uh, uh, of, of uh, spirit and cosmos. They continued, even though officially the revolution was atheistic. So we have another question with regards to methodology, excuse me. Primary sources, their preservation and accessibility are very important to the nature of your research and scholarship. How has this reality hindered or enhanced your research in Cuba and elsewhere? Primary sources? Um, I, I made it longer. <laughs> it essentially made the process of writing the book, Ramona, a lot longer, but far more fruitful. So as a literary scholar by training, um, we, 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 we use primary sources, but our relationship to historical, to primaries, the primary sources uh, of history is different than the relationship that a historian would have. Um, so when I'm looking at a primary source, I'm reading that source through a particular lens. I might read it through the lens of gender. We're talking a lot about gender today. Or I might read it through the lens of race. Uh, or perhaps to see if there is some reference to a Bakongo or Yoruba idea of spirituality. Um, I lived in Maine for many years. I was a professor, a Spanish professor at uh, Bates College. And one of the best things about being at Bates College was my proximity to Harvard. And Harvard has this incredibly large archive, uh, not only on Cuban studies, but particularly on 19th century Cuban studies. And so I was able to consult, I believe it's, I believe it's eight different archives spent time at Harvard, uh, I owe them a great debt of gratitude, uh, spent some time at Yale. So I wanted to look at some things that Professor William Luis had referred to. Uh, he made a significant contribution to the study of Juan Francisco Manzano by publishing Manzano's manuscript, the manuscript of his slave narrative or emancipation narrative. But I spent time in Cuba, six different locations in Cuba, uh, the National Archive, um, uh, time at the National Library, uh, Yasnai Cuesta was at the time a, um, como se llama esa cosa que fue, ah, she was a bibliotecaria. She was a librarian at the Institute of Language and Linguistics. She's a woman of African descent, incredible librarian, and now also a professor in Cuba. Um, and so uh, it took me everywhere. What I do essentially in the book, to put it, uh, in case there's any graduate students watching, what I do essentially in the book is I, do close reading of several texts. If I want to understand a poem or I want to understand Monsanto's emancipation narrative, I use the narrative itself, looking for the silences in the text, uh, as well as looking for the repetitions, looking for any curious use of language. Uh, I look at the ethno-historic record to understand the text. Uh, I look at the trial record from the proceedings uh, in 1844. Um, and I also look at um, anthropology, cultural anthropology, anything we know uh, about the Yoruba speaking or Kikongo speaking peoples in Cuba at the time. Uh, and then I also look at the biographies of the authors, all those things in order to construct meaning. So I speak when the text is silent. I am a literary archaeologist, uh, as uh, the late Toni Morrison would put it. May she rest in strength. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I was wondering if you would speak to Hachui, the Haitian influence on Placido Atue. and the 1844 insurrection. Mm -hmm. Atue. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Atue. Um, well, with regard to Atue, Atue was significant. The last image that I showed today uh, when I did the slideshow towards the beginning of this live stream was an image of an indigenous man, presumably Atue or someone like him who was being burned alive at the stake uh, by, interestingly enough, not only the Spanish military, not only the invaders of what is today Haiti uh, and Cuba, but, uh, but also by um, essentially the, the, the Spanish priests. Uh, now the soldiers most likely uh, lit the fuse 
But what's significant here is that the priesthood played the role to legitimate uh, the violence, right? Remembering the papal rule from the mid 15th century where the Catholic church, where the Pope himself uh, gives Portugal the authority to enslave as a process of religious conversion. So Portuguese religious conversion and Spanish religious conversion during the colonial period is not an act of largesse. It is an act uh, in many, many cases of violence. And that's very significant. Uh, what's so powerful about Plasto's poetry is that though he had been baptized into the Catholic church and he married in the church, right? Uh, and he called himself a Catholic, yo soy católico. Uh, what the Cubans say is yo soy católico a mi manera. I'm Catholic my own way. And um, there's two poems in particular where the figure that you're referring to, Ramona, Atue, who was a Taino monarch. Atue himself uh, is a 16th century figure, figure from 1500s, that century where the Spanish are, uh, they're in Mexico, but they're in the Caribbean before they're in Mexico, right? It's from Cuba that the Spanish launched their attack on the Mexica Empire right, in 1519. And that siege lasts a number of years. Um, but while they're still in the, what, what is today the Hispanic from Caribbean and Haiti, they come across Atue. And Atue uh, is fleeing the Spanish. He comes into, if I remember correctly, he's fleeing the Spanish. He leaves what is Haiti. He comes into Eastern Cuba and he meets the Spanish there. And in uh, Eastern Cuba, he's faced with a dilemma because the Spanish have more firepower than he, than he does. He's faced with a dilemma Will he convert to Spanish Catholicism uh, and be in heaven with the Span Spaniards, or will he be uh, remain? Uh, will he give up his life, be burned alive, and go back to his ancestors? And Atue makes the decision to return to the ancestors, and that's a that was a, a political decision, a very significant political decision. So the um, uh, the story of Atue, the historical anecdote of Atue is something that's passed on in Cuban history. And Atue became, for the organizers of the 1844 anti-slavery movement, who sought to bring independence to Cuba, uh, as well as to abolish slavery. Uh, they, some of the members of that movement sought to take Atue's name and to rename Cuba for Atue in the ways that Desalin and, uh, and other Africans and African descendants in San Domingue had done uh, in turning San Domingue into Haiti. And so it's a direct, there's a direct parallel there conceptually between the type of ancestor work that Haitians were doing, uh, particularly those who, you know, had the West Central African inspiration, that Vodou, right, West Central and West African inspiration with what Plasso does to the figure of Atue. In one poem, he says that Atue's remains lie beneath the surface. It says, who knows, maybe Atue's remains, his skeleton intact, lies beneath the surface. And one of the, those poems. Uh, so what I argue in the book is, you know, essentially that Manasseh and Plasto are using these African ideas of spirit and cosmos and they're coding them. Uh, they're uh, essentially disguising them in the language of Spanish Catholicism and literary tropes. And in this case, he's using a literary trope uh, in order to do so. So the mountains where Atue's bodies lie are significant, would have been significant to the indigenous ancestors, but in the Spanish literary tradition, it's locus amenus. It's a beautiful landscape. It's a peaceful landscape. And he takes that landscape and he politicizes it. Thank you. Thank you. So in your book, you argue that Placido portrayed the African masquerade Iremi that is pro prominent in the Akbakua male initi initiation society. Can you discuss a bit about this society and their relationship to the book? And Well, as a, as a, as a matter of fact, uh, <laughs> that's a, that could take us from here to the moon. <laughs> But uh, I would say, briefly speaking, Abakwa, of the African-inspired religions that my book actually deals with, uh, Abakwa is the third of the three traditions. Uh, I don't deal with it in great depth, but it's significant to my reading of Plasso's work uh, because he has a poem called The Little Devil. 
or El Diablito. And El Diablito is a poem about an African masquerade on the 6th of January in Havana, uh, Epiphany, essentially in the, in the Catholic calendar, and uh, also known as the Day of Kings or Dia de los Reyes, uh, the three kings that bring gifts to the Christ child. Well, this is the day in Havana particularly where Africans who had their own religious brotherhoods or confraternities, their cabildos, right, were able to have a celebration. And when they had their celebrations, they brought out their own masquerades and other images of their, once again, I'm not gonna use the word deities, but of their African divine spirits. Um, those spirits that stand between mankind and creator, Olodumare, Olodumalofi, in the Yoruba tradition. Well, one of those traditions comes out of West Africa, uh, the Cross Rivers region in between Nigeria and Cameroon. And it's Efik and Ejagham inspired, Efik and Ejagham inspired. There's a leopard society uh, that comes out of that particular region, Calabar, and be the city that I'm referring to. Ivor Miller wrote a really brilliant and detailed book about this leopard society. It's a male initiation society. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's some, it was for many years shrouded in secrecy. It was for black men. And I'm saying that phenotypically, it was for black men. Um, but the significance here in terms of Flossie though, is here he was once again, an African descendant of a lighter hue, whose mother was a white Spaniard from Northern Spain, who's not only identifying with the, uh, African Cuban community, uh, but has married it to a political family, a family that is anti-slavery in its uh, political posture. Uh, and he produces these poems about these African cabildos, presumably mulatos, people who identify as a different racial group than blacks in Spanish America were supposed to demonstrate that they were more assimilated into Spanish Catholic culture. And he rejected that, though clearly he knew how to play uh, with the margins, but his politics demonstrate that he rejected this politics of becoming white. Blacks don't have to become white, right? So he rejects the politics of white supremacy, in effect. And what he does with this particular African masquerade is uh, ireme, which would be the term we use in, in, uh, in Cuba, is that the masquerade is dancing around on the 6th of January. And Plasto says in the poem that onlookers are laughing and they're mocking it. And you have to think Havana's a port city like New Orleans, like Mobile, where I live, right? It's a port city, but it was a far, you know, more, uh, far more robust, you know, port city, um, even than where I live now. And so you have ships coming from all over the world and people are here for the festivities. They're there for carnival, what we call here Mardi Gras, right? We do it in February. That was the 6th of January there. And they're looking at this masquerade and they're thinking, oh, you know, this is just, uh, this is a hodgepodge of something that they made up. Uh, this is a mess. But Plaza says in the poem, what they don't know, what the onlookers refuse to understand is that this particular African masquerade has come to impose the law upon them. It has come to impose a law upon them. It's really Plaza's reference to the cabildo, to the masquerader himself, as well as to the fact that he's come to impose a law upon them that give you some clues about Plasso's notion of the sacred world, his claim to sacred authority in the process of organizing an anti-slavery rebellion. Uh, so I don't argue that he was the leader of that rebellion. I think that still needs to be determined. We think it might've been a Haitian man named Luis Guigo, uh, but no one could find that brother. That brother got away. So <laughs> we don't really know. But essentially this poem is important because it ties Plasos to these African cabildos, which were presumed, which, which we respected African leadership, not the leadership of light-skinned um, Cuban-born folk. So it's really powerful that he wrote these poems and that he demonstrated knowledge of their practices. It suggests a proximity, not only to African descended culture, but a proximity to this particular society, the Abakwa society. So I hope that answers your question. Thank you, Matt. So we drawing close to our end. So we'd like to open up for other questions that our audience may have. Um, you can just put them in our chat, our public chat, and we can go through any more questions or comments that anyone may have. We also have a survey. 
that um, you can see in the chat box, a survey monkey. If you can um, fill that out, that would be very helpful for us as we create programs in the future. We also want to invite people that are interested in supporting us, either as collaborators, backers of some sort, or future interns or volunteers. Please contact our director, uh, Ms. Makiba Foster, or our programming manager, Ms. Erin Daniels, and both of their emails are in the chat as well. Um, do we have any other questions? Okay. I think if no one else has any other questions. Well, Dr. Petway, I'd like to thank you so much for this afternoon for sharing um, your ideas, your thoughts, and your wonderful book, which I'm going to bring close so everybody can see it once again, so they'll know what to look for. They can go on Amazon and get it. Um, and we want to thank you so much for sharing this lovely work with us. And um, thank you for everything, man. A quick from Chantel Moore. Do you want me to take that, or, or I could respond offline? I can't, I can't hear you, Ramona. Can't hear me. Okay, you have a question. The question is, does the book cover Cuban political literature? So that is a very, that's a very broad category, Cuban political literature. Um, I'm not exactly sure what Ms. Moore uh, may mean by Cuban political literature, but I can say that the book does explore. Uh, okay, she says she's interested in Maceo. Uh, well, Maceo, who was a Cuban of African descent, who was the most important, I, I would argue, the most important military leader of the Cuban Wars for Independence between 1868 and 1898. He is killed in hostilities against the Spanish Empire prior to 1898. Doesn't make it to 1898, unfortunately. But Maceo uh, is born after Manzano and Plaza both have passed away. So my book essentially starts in 1797 and it ends in uh, 1844. Um, so it doesn't actually deal with one, uh, I'm sorry, it doesn't deal with Antonio Maceo or his mother, Mariana Grajales, uh, or his brothers uh, who all fought for Cuban independence. But I'll, I'll leave you with this because we're in a moment, a political moment in which we're faced with a choice in the United States and elsewhere around the world, uh, essentially between, um, anti-racist democracy or authoritarianism anti-racist democracy or authoritarianism. And, uh, and it's really essentially necessary for us to make a decision if we're going to be an anti-racist system, a democratic system as the country changes demographically, as we know that the population of European descent, uh, it's not on rapid decline, but certainly the members of the global majority, that population is growing. And so there's a need for the nation to reckon with its history. There's a need for the nation to reckon essentially with its identity and this is a moment in which the United States can reject myth and embrace its histories in the plural. Looking at the role of women, we're talking, we're 20 years, I'm sorry, we're 100 years since women got the right to vote uh, uh, in the U.S. Constitution. So this apropos to have this conversation. And uh, I, I would simply say that, you know, it's important for us to remember in this moment that we have a choice and that we can, uh, we can do what is necessary to build uh, an anti racist uh, democracy. So I hope that Cuban literature in the age of black insurrection, though it is about 19th century Cuba, will in some way contribute to that goal. Ashe. Well, we've come to about the end. And again, I want to thank Dr. Petway for all his insight. Um, I want to thank our audience for all your support, your great questions. Um, your comments, your feedback for Dr. Petway. And uh, we have someone that has said, we want him back. So we're gonna have to figure that out. Hopefully we'll be back to the public soon and we'll be able to bring him here live. Oh, I um, love that. But we wanna thank everyone. Um, this was a successful moment, day, afternoon and enjoy everyone. Please stay safe and remember to visit 
our sessions, our website, so you know what we're doing here at the African American Research Library and Cultural Center, as well as Broward County Library. Thank you so much and have a wonderful day. Stay safe. Bye. I say all, I say all. <laughs> Good. Thank you. All right. Good job. Thank you, Aaron. So much. Thank you.